Welcome to another expert cast. Today we are going to be talking about property sourcing. Delighted to be joined today by Janice Minahan. Janice is an entrepreneur who eats, breathes, and lives property. With a teaching career spanning 15 years, property was always her next favorite thing to do. After having a family, she became very disillusioned with the educational system and decided to pursue property in earnest after moving to the UK from Australia in 2014. Janice focuses on working to improve the life of not just herself, but her family and has established several successful businesses within the last five years. Janice, thank you very much for your time today. Nice to be here, Rob. Thanks for having me. Give her, I mean, it's quite a lot to take in there. Moving from Australia to the UK to start off with is, you know, a great achievement uh, because some people get scared of moving country. But before we get into the nooks and crannies of property sourcing, can you just give people a little bit more background about yourself, uh, where you were and how you've ended up doing what you're doing now? Yeah, sure. So as you said, I'm a property entrepreneur, I think more so than a teacher. Well, I love teaching. Um, the paperwork side of it did me in in the end and I couldn't do what I wanted to do with teaching children. So property allowed me to get out, embrace various strategies, be creative and through education discovered a whole heap of strategies that I could utilise. And being from Australia, moving here, even though I'd been here off and on over the last 10 years before that, um, it gave me an opportunity to go and explore that property idea, get some education and start fresh. So that's exactly what I did. And in five years, I've done many more strategies than I'd ever have done in Australia or did in Australia in the seven years beforehand. And like to consider that I know what I'm doing now. I think it's fair to say, given your successes, that you do know what you're doing. Um, so I don't, I don't think anyone's going to, out on that one bit especially when we get into into the details of darning sourcing yeah no sourcing is something that i didn't quite know was even a career but as it turns out you can help lots of people through sourcing and do it ethically so that's what i'm about so happy to share what i know with you i'm great really looking forward to getting deep into that in terms of what got you into property i know you mentioned you become disillusioned with the educational system was there a particular what was there a particular moment that made you go I, I need to do something different or was it a book that you read how, how did that moment feel and what happened yeah probably two main moments sort of I just had my second child and on maternity leave always doing property to take the children off to viewings with me my dad was a builder and was doing sort of projects in a different part of queensland but I was watching him from the sidelines, I guess. And then he flipped two properties in quick succession and made one and a half times my teaching salary just out of those two. So that was my first one going, right, I probably need to learn a bit more about this because my hard graph that I'm doing in teaching to what he's just done over a few months is um, worth considering. And then the second one, when I moved to the UK and I couldn't teach for 11 weeks, I picked up Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which my dad had given me about uh, years beforehand that I've never had time to read, and I read that. And by the end of that book, I decided I was going to go to a Rich Dad, Poor Dad two-hour seminar, and the rest is history. That book is seminal. Uh, so many people say it, it's, it's, it was that book that really made them open their eyes, and you've obviously got the practical example there of your dad as well. So, you know, that's, it's good to have that, it's good to have that blend. Yeah, it um, changed my life quite literally. How, how, why did you end up moving to the UK? Was that a family reason or that just because of the opportunities that presented themselves in, in the UK? No, family reason. My husband's family are from Lancashire and I wanted my children really to get to know their English family rather than being teenagers or adults before they met them so they could have the best of both worlds and the property market in the UK being a positive geared model as opposed to Australia's which is negatively geared just really allowed me to flourish and do what I could never do in Australia really so it served many purposes and I love it. Must have been quite a culture shock and a weather shock moving from Australia to Lancashire. Yeah a little bit different I'm from Brisbane and the weather's perfect pretty much year-round 
So um, apart from spending the first 12 months in a coat and very warm clothes, I got, I'm acclimatised now and I'm very proud to say I'm quite warm at eight degrees, whereas in Brisbane, that's a really cold day. If you go up to Newcastle, I think people will be throwing their toys out of the pram. I think uh, <laughs> they like it a bit colder up there. But, uh, it nice, is. I'll stick to Lancashire. <laughs> it's a lovely part of, it's a lovely part of the country anyway but it is moving on to property sourcing then so how there's many different ways it, it can be done but what is property sourcing and how does it work so basically property sourcing is for me being able to fulfill my clients criteria of what they're looking for in a property um it's mainly about being ethical without that I don't think you get anything and all my clients given that they're either they're all out of area but either UK based or internationally based they need to trust the person who's sourcing them a property that it fits their criteria they hand predominantly handing over a lot of money and some of them don't even see their property so for me it's important that they've gone from having this idea of wanting to buy a property to having a successful property at the end of it that can generate income for them. So w- would you say a property sourcer is a bit like an estate agent or is there a, a key difference between the two? Definitely similarities to an estate agent. However, an estate agent works for the seller and is trying to get the best price for the seller, whereas a source is working for the buyer and trying to just mould the relationship and find the deal that works for them. And different investors have different criteria and they're looking for different things, different strategies. And I think that's where the the key to being a successful sourcer is, is being to adapt your toolbox to suit a property or an area or an investor's needs, as opposed to just ringing up an estate agent and viewing as many or whatever they've got on the market at whatever price point and then trying to sell you it. And it not, might not actually fit your criteria in the beginning anyway. So if someone was looking at starting a property sourcing business from scratch, would you say it's more important to have clients lined up with their details first so you know what you're looking for or to get some random deals in, in the bank and then try and find people to buy them? How would you approach that? Really interesting question, exactly where I started. So when I started out as an investor, I did get the odd property accepted. So I did what my training said and I got 40 offers out. And then sometimes you get several that drop in at the same time, but you can't do all of them and they were good deals. So I went, I went looking initially for people to buy them, take them off my hands because I didn't want to let the estate agent down. And it was really hard and I lost a couple. And then on the backside of that, you, you lose face with the agent. So through our platform, propertydealstore.co.uk, we developed this platform to allow people who do have deals, might be initial in their initial stages, to put their deals on and we have the database so we can marry the two up because it's really hard. You can get the client base and then never get a deal. Um, so we've tried to fill that niche by developing our platform. If someone was just starting in sourcing, do you, would you say that... Starting in sourcing. Yeah, if for what you've achieved and what you've just said about a property deal store, do you think someone would be able to do that uh, from straight away or is it important to take time to focus on building the relationships both with the agents and people that want to invest but don't necessarily want to do the legwork? If they can, yeah, I think like networking is key. So if they wanted to be a sourcer and make it, they might want to start it off as a side hustle, I guess, to their current job with the the eventual goal to be to move out of their job and focus on sourcing because it can be very lucrative if you do it right. Um, and as we progress, becoming a regulated deal sourcer holds you in good stead, which I can go through later. But it, right at the start, it's all about relationships and whether you do that with the agents in your local area or you go to networking meets and meet your investors and it's not just a one-time meeting and they go on your database. It's usually over a series of weeks, months, years sometimes, until they've got that know, like and trust and that's how you grow and be able to form both sides of the puzzle. So you're getting the deals through and you've also got investors to source them to. 
that's important. That, that's really good information for someone to to take away. And, and you mentioned that the uh, sourcing can be quite lucrative. Well, and you know, look forward to touching based on a couple of examples of deals that have been that have been done. If someone was looking to use a property sourcer, would your advice be again just build that relationship, build that rapport? Um, yeah, what what would the big what would the big no nos be if of property sourcing? You know, would someone be expected to pay the fees up front? Uh, what do the fees look like? Does that vary on the deal? How, how does that side of it work? So the fee, fees do vary on the deal. Uh, it depends on your area as well. So the bigger deals might have a percentage fee, say one percent, two percent of the overall project. So commercial to residential, for example, would probably be more of a percentage whereas for example what I do locally is I find a property and depending on the return on investment ROI I base my sourcing fee on how strong those numbers are and different investors require different ROIs um, but generally let's just say for today for example I've sourced one uh, it's a four thousand pound deal from as a sourcer so I require a thousand pound reservation fee to take it off the table. I encourage them to come and do a viewing. I give them all the information they need up front to make an informed decision. Once they've viewed it, if they didn't want to continue it, I'd refund their reservation fee. If they did want to continue it, then that fee becomes non-refundable and the rest, the remainder of the fee is due on completion. And I think that's pretty standard practice. I see stories that, or you hear stories that uh, people, uh, agents, sourcing agents, sometimes requesting all the money up front. And basically, people that are operating very dodgy. Uh, would you say that's quite common when you're talking to other property strategy, uh, other property sources, or that's just the odd one or two making it bad for everyone else? I think it's becoming less and less common. I, I have heard. And I have seen some of my own clients who have been bitten by sources in the past and makes them really sceptical, of course, to go on to using another sourcer because obviously the first experience wasn't great. They've lost money. And unfortunately, it's really hard to claw it back, um, which I think for somebody who's regulated in the first place, that sets them apart from anyone who says they're a sourcer because you've got to spend money to be regulated and then you abide by the rules that are out there. And for me, I wouldn't touch anybody who wasn't regulated in the first place. And I think that's where the property industry is going through a change and this is becoming more common. It's the only type of sources I will deal with. Moving on to regulation then, can you just explain what sort of regulations you would have to adhere to being a legitimate property sourcing agent? Yeah, sure. So there's only a few key things really. And they're not, there's lots of stories of going around out there and sourcing is the new buzzword. And there's lots of um, property courses that you can go and learn how to be a sourcer. And then I have people contact me through the platform and ring and have a chat because they're looking to become source, sourcing agents. And they get told that it's going to cost them about £2,000 to get regulated. But really, when you break it down, you can do it all for about five to six hundred pounds, depending on like which insurance broker you use. So, for example, you need professional indemnity insurance. That's your most expensive. You need to be registered for anti-money laundering. Actually, sorry, that's the most expensive. PI insurance isn't uh, onerous. Being a member of the NRLA is good practice anyway. Um, that's minimal. Data protection through the ICO, 30 pounds a year. And being part of something like the property redress scheme just shows you're on, anyone can Google you through the PRS and see that you are part of their body. And again, it's like 80 pounds a year. So it's, I think it's for what it is and it steps you apart aside from the rest, then um, it's well worth the investment. And then from an investor's point of view, your advice would be when you're looking to team up with a sourcing agent, these are the things that you should look for because it steps proper people Absol apart absolutely yep and it's all easy to find on the internet if they go to each of those websites the sourcer would have to produce their own pi insurance but the rest of them you could just have a look online and make sure they're 
registered. Uh, hypothetically speaking, if you've, you, you've, you find a, a project for someone and let's just say they live in a foreign country and they're not able to view the property physically, would you then, uh, as an agent, sourcing agent, would you then look to do uh, maybe a Skype viewing? Would you send photos? How would that process work if I was looking to invest from abroad? So my, my international clients know me personally. And that's how I run my sourcing service anyway. But if they were, if they just found a sourcer and they thought a deal looked good and they didn't know much about them, as well as checking out their regulation, if they wanted to check out a property further, then a sourcer should produce the very minimum photos of the product of the property. Um, a lot because of where we're at at the moment, video, like videos of the property are good. We you could do a live, yeah, Skype or a Zoom and walk through the property and have a look. And things like refurb quotes or put them in touch with your builder and they could have a chat. Just anything that will help them get a full picture of the property in question. Because it is a big, the big thing if you're international. I actually don't know that I could do it, but it's a lot of trust. And I think you've got to be confident that the person you're putting that trust in can carry the deal through. And as you said before, it takes time to build trust the trust doesn't just happen after one day no not at all it's a series and it's um yeah there are a variety of means so if you're a sourcer and you're treating it like a business then you should have a facebook page and you you might have a website you might not but a lot of people do business these days through social media and they can see the types of deals you have testimonials anything like that which will build your credibility what would the big red flags be? And again, I appreciate for people listening and if you're reading this as well, coming from an investor point of view, we'll sort of move on from that aspect moving forward. But from an investor point of view, are there any other red flags that, well, are there any other potential red flags to the things to look out for if you're new to property and you're looking to get the first couple of deals done via a source? Any, any red flags that you can advise people of? Yeah, pretty much. Your regulation's key. The other one is money up front. A source, a genuine source of looking to help other people should never or would never, that I know of, request a whole sourcing fee up front. It needs to be have a portion of being refundable. Um, and just open and honest. If you've asked for photos, they'd be able to produce photos of the, and they're accurate. So it's no point fluffing it up because it is what it is at the end of the day. And that's all based on credibility and relationships and if you can't get clear answers out of the saucer then maybe they're not the saucer for you great advice that's uh, so take heed of that for people looking to get started and of course if you're looking to get started as a property saucer as janice says look at all the regulations set yourself up properly and you see if you treat it like a business you get business results if you treat it like a hobby you get hobby results absolutely Normally throughout the series, I'm asking how people pick their area. Uh, you said for family ties, you, you've ended up in Lancashire and then you've got sort of existing clients uh, as well, which is great. But if someone was, let's just say I'm based in, I don't know, pick a random place, uh, Middlesbrough. I'm based in Middlesbrough. Um, I'm just getting, I'm fresh into property. I'm based in Middlesbrough. Uh, would you say to follow the same principles give yourself a name get yourself regulated and then find find clients and what they're after because if you have some clients that say well i want some buy to lets or i want commercial conversions within an area you can do multiple sourcing strategies is that is that a fair assumption is that a right thing to say yeah yeah that's perfect uh, what i did forget to say before if you are setting up as a source so you also need a client account and that proves to your investor that you are keeping things separate. You are doing it business-like and a client account just keeps everything nice and clean, refunds, sourcing fees, everything can go through that. Um, but, yeah, if you were, say, in Middlesbrough, I think you're in a great part of the world anyway because everyone wants to invest up north and set yourself up first and foremost. That might take a couple of weeks, but then... What, the mistake I made right in the beginning was looking to an area an hour away from where I lived 
So I had all that travel time and actually never got a single deal there. And then when I finally looked at the town I lived in, it was perfect. So if you're in a northern town, very hot spot, very good hot spot for investors anyway, then check out your town, talk to the agents, see what the deals are, see what the key strategies are for a start. And if you are new and starting, then you might just start on sourcing by to let's move into HMOs or commercial. It's only five years down the track now with some commercial experience that I'd even consider sourcing those kind of deals. If you're dealing with agents, then if you're dealing with agents and you know you're a sourcer, would you be upfront and say that to the agents or would you sort of do it a bit under the radar uh, or, or does that lead to many, too many problems and a, a break of faith further on down the line? So over the years, initially, well, my, my theory is if I find a deal and I aim to source it because they all know me very well now because I've built that relationship over the years, um, I will tell them I'm sourcing it. But in the early days, as an investor, I guess I had a little bit of an, an advantage in that whatever I couldn't source, my goal was to purchase it myself. So firstly, if I wouldn't be prepared to purchase it myself, then I wouldn't source it out. If I couldn't find a buyer or the deal fell out, then I had to have the means to go and find the money or invest in it myself because I didn't want to let anybody down. And that served me really well. And I bought properties that I had sourced where six months down the track, the buyers pulled out for whatever reason. And then I've completed on it a couple of weeks later, just so the vendor hasn't lost his sale after all of that. And that's as recent as last year. So, um, Whereas I do know a lot of people go into sourcing. They might be young, looking to get into property. They don't have much of a pot. And it, it depends which agents you work with and whether they're comfortable with you sourcing on a property that they've got listed because you're not the direct buyer. So, again, it comes back to relationships and what, um, what you can arrange with them. Because if they know you've got a su supply of investors that are different to their investors, then it can be a win-win and it can work really well. In terms of finding deals, we've just focused on agents there. I mean, there's, I imagine there's multiple ways in which you can obtain deals. Uh, can you just, before we go into that, can you just explain uh, the difference between what an off-market deal would be in comparison to what a, a normal on-market deal is? So off market, as they say, uh, your net worth, your network is your net worth. Um, and so those off-market deals come through that network and advertising and being on the ground and being trustworthy. And so you get these direct to vendor leads potentially, whether that be from you to you directly or from somebody else. And then you're able to follow it up and put together a deal that's a win for them and a win for you and a win for the investor. And so there's plenty of deals out there. And if you can get that direct to vendor sort of deal, then you can create that win-win scenario and hopefully all parties get what they need out of it. And if you're sourcing, you mentioned your network, which is good, but are there any other methods? I mean, leaflets, paper advertising, how would you go about obtaining as many leads as possible? Yeah. So places like Gumtree and leaflets, flyers, business cards, um, I've done letters through doors, just talking to people, empty houses, knock on the house next door, you might get some information. You could land registry for three pounds, a particular property that you might know is empty, been empty for a long time. You could do land registry and find the address of the owner and the owner, uh, send them a letter. And I know people have been very successful with that method. Um, across social media, various newspapers magazines not so popular but i do people still use newspapers people still read newspapers um just depends what your appetite is i guess your budget and how much time you've got to invest in it rolling on to some examples we said we touched base on them as well so again you don't have to give away location or anything like that but some examples of deals that you've done in that involve different strategies. If you can run through some numbers, that would be absolutely fantastic. 
Yeah, sure. So my bread and butter deals are in an up and coming town, for example, and I pick selective licensing areas because generally speaking, they're lower priced than the um, better areas of town. But it depends. It depends on the strategy. So my strategy is mini HMOs. Um, selective licensing areas in my town are very centrally located to town centre, to public transport, and it works really well and they're really popular with investors. So I go for those areas. I can pick up properties under 40000 So for an investor that's enticing, there's no stamp duty at the moment. And we work with the council then to use what we call an empty home loan to bring those properties back into use. And obviously an added incentive for an investor is if they can get £20,000 interest free to help them with the refurb and bring a property back into use. It not only provides excellent accommodation for somebody or the mini HMO for rooms going forward, it helps the council with their headache and having these empty homes just sitting there in these areas. And the investor gets a really high yielding property. So that's my core. Whereas if I had an investor who wants just a standard buy to let, they've got a higher budget, they want to put it on a mortgage, I would look slightly outside of those areas and find them a better property in a better location and cater for the, the most of those clients want like a working family or professionals. And so you need to know your area like the back of your hand. And in terms of the numbers that you make from that, and again, you, you know, any examples you got is, is useful. I know you say that you charge yeah. roughly depending on what the ROI is. But is that what would your minimum fee be? What's you know, have you got an average fee? Um, okay, so yeah, let's so people go through. understand. Yeah, just so people understand. Yeah, yeah. So let's just say this one, for example, today is a thirty-five thousand pound property. My fee for it is four thousand pounds. It is entitled to a £20,000 interest-free loan and from the council, but the refurb on that kind of property because it has been left empty for a long time, you're looking at about a £30,000 refurb. So, well, the council loan's great, doesn't cover it all, and the done-up value of something in that area, you might be looking at fifty five to 60000 So, yes, it's great, but it's if you look at the numbers, slightly negative equity but they're popular because you can cash flow it as a mini HMO rather than a buy-to-let. And the numbers using that kind of strategy don't really work as a buy-to-let, although as a backup, it's, it's a good option as well. Um, so that's my standard deal. I've done other ones in slightly better areas, for example, like a £75,500 property. You'd be looking at £25,000. Everything I buy needs a refurb. So £25,000 refurb and I strip them right back and put them all back together so they don't need touching for hopefully 10 years. And then you're looking at a done up value. Well, I've actually sold this particular one and I sold it at 112. So, and that's five minutes from where I've got the £35,000 property, if that. So just <laughs> very, areas are very, important to know because one side of the street might work fabulous and then the other side doesn't or top and bottom that kind of thing how did you go about setting the sourcing prices because it seems from you know research a lot of people yeah, everyone's got their own methodology of of doing it uh, you know do you yeah, suppose if, again if someone's just starting and they're not familiar with dealing with sources and they might not know what a fair price is to pay for having a deal sourced. Is there any, any advice yeah. you can give people on, on that front? Yeah, so if you are new, you do have to start somewhere and people do appreciate that if you're open and honest. And so potentially you might just start at a couple of thousand when you start sourcing just to start building up your reputation, building up a bank of investors. And then as you start getting established and people come to you, the tables turn a little bit. So if you can give people what they want within a specified time frame, um, then and you're producing a quality service and you've got systems in place and all of that kind of stuff, then that's sometimes, and depending on the numbers, like the ROI, then you can start to command a higher fee. 
And I guess that's just growth over over time and reputation. It all comes down to reputation, really. And there'd be no harm in testing testing that as well, because effectively you're adding, it, as being a middle person, a source that can add a lot of value for absolutely a hands-off investor. And this is, this is quite common when... It's, it's just a numbers game. You have to factor in, you know, if you're living abroad or you're not even living anywhere near your investment area, a lot of, you know, some people do start, I will say criticising, it's not the right word, but some people will look at a sourcing fee and go, well, I'm not paying yeah. that. Then the option yeah. is, well, then you go and find it yourself. There, there is a, a cost to the service, isn't there? Absolutely. And, it, and it's that if you find the right sourcer and they might, so one might specialise in buy to lets, one might specialise in commercial to resi conversions, whatever. But that knowledge and that fee that they're commanding, that's what you're, they're saving you the legwork, they're saving you the time up and down the motorway, they're saving you, they've already got the relationships established. So oftentimes the property may be BMV that potentially you couldn't get on the market for that kind of price, but because it also has those relationships, those um, trade properties, through, say it was an agent or whoever, regularly, then um, the sourcing fee, may the amount you save on using a sourcer, the sourcing fee becomes a great deal even included in the property in the first place because it's not something you could actually get potentially yourself. It is all a numbers game and it's, it's how investors look at that as well. I know that... You know, if I was abroad and had a solid relationship, it's fair to say that we do, to be honest, you know, we've worked together before. Yeah. So we've got that that trust between us as well. I know if I was abroad and something popped up and it met the criteria, you know, implicitly, we just go ahead and do it because we've, you know, we've, we've uh, done that before because of, of, of what you've just said, that, that value's there. Yes, it's an extra few thousand or whatever it is, but factor that into the numbers, then you've got to do your analysis and, you know, the sort of pressure's taken off you then um, if you're looking to, you know, buy, you know, looking to buy. It's, it's leveraging other people's networks and, you know, systems. And there's always going to be a cost to that or, or an investment to that if you're looking from an investor's point of view. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is all about the numbers and deals that a sourcer may present, especially if they're off market, then that's where I believe real quality, well, I was going to say real quality deals are created because you don't have that agent um, in there either and you're just dealing directly with a vendor who has come to you in the first place because you can help them um, and it's they're obviously in a bind or for whatever reason motivated to sell and your expertise in putting together that deal could serve an investor that's not in the area and helps them build their portfolio. Devil's in the detail, absolutely. It's, yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree with you. I'm, I'm even lost for words. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> couldn't agree more with you on that. Um, a lot of times people are going to be asked to sign an NDA. Uh, what is an NDA and what purpose does an NDA serve? So a non-disclosure agreement is a standard practice in property, standard resources. Um, if you were interested in a deal, it's a document that you sign that you don't disclose the information for your information and your eyes only. And it gives the source of some protection that, and I'm, I'd like, you'd like to think that people don't do this, but unfortunately it does happen occasionally, that they don't approach a vendor or somebody directly. If the source has put all the time and effort into getting a deal done, that they're not circumvented by a potential buyer going directly to that owner, say, offering them a sweeter deal to cut the sourcer out. So it protects um, the sourcer, I guess, from that making sure their deals are looked after. Has that happened to you before when someone's gone behind your back and unfortunately done that? No, not not me personally. I'm I'm really lucky, but I think that's because I take the time to get to know people and I think if you've got that mutual bond, then you're doing right by everybody. There's no need for them. If the, the numbers speak for themselves, like you said, the devil's in the detail. So if it doesn't work with the sourcing fee, then they're not going to buy it. And what works for one person may not work for another. I think that just comes down to how 
how you can put together particular deals. So it sounds like the thing that you've explained so far that it's very, give, given a couple of weeks, it can be very straightforward to get this strategy up and running, uh, yet it, it is going to take time to build up those solid relationships and then find out who you can trust and who's a bit, you know, iffy. To, to say the least. So yeah. it's, like it's easy to start, but once you're actually really into it, it's going to take time to build up the trust and the network, which is, is quite well, it's common in property anyway, isn't it? Yeah, and it's really important to take the time to build that up. Rome wasn't built in a day, as they say. So it's, and initially when I started, I did pair up with other sources and I had, we like, it's very common that people do 50-50 splits. So you might be good at finding deals. You might have somebody with the network and you might split the sourcing fee between you because you've both both roles are vital. Um, you can't have one without the other. So that's popular in the early days as well. Um, and then as you grow that network yourself, you might start doing more and more deals on your own and you get all sourcing fee. But it just depends what works for different people. What would you say the advantages of doing property sourcing are in comparison to, say, I don't know, yeah, other strategies, service accommodation, HMOs, buy to lets. Well, what are the advantages of doing property sourcing? I think when you become good at a particular skill and you hone it and you look after it, I recently heard a quote where the grass is greener where you water it, then not only do you generate an income, a healthy income for you, you could do one deal a month and that's £3,000 a month, say, but the bigger picture is you're helping people build a portfolio there are a lot of investors out there who are looking for deals and if you can cater for their needs not only are you helping them but you're helping yourself as well and it just it just works but it all comes down to taking the time to do it properly and it, it it's not a two-month job and i'm up and running so that would be my advice and then on the flip side and you know this podcast series in this book as well is about providing reality so just trying to get some of that in there as well what would you say the disadvantages are of doing property sourcing disadvantages um the breakdown in relationships so if it if communication's poor um anywhere in the whole deal then deals can fall over um vendors become frustrated Estate agents potentially don't want to deal with you anymore if you are using estate agents. Um, they have finance issues or you have a solicitors who might be slow at producing answers to queries, all of that conveyancing process. Then, yeah, it can become very tedious. But as a sourcer, that's what you've got to become good at. Communication, you deal with all parties and look after all parties whether you act, you might act for the buyer, but you're also sourcing a deal. Sorry, yeah, the buyer, but you're also looking after the seller in a sense as well. So it's just managing all those relationships. And otherwise, if the chain essentially breaks or a cog breaks, then um, your whole deal can fall out and it doesn't reflect well on you as a sourcer. I can well imagine so. And would you say it's what, for people that are- getting started would you say it can be quite disadvantageous the fact that sourcing is relatively chunky money i.e you're not going to get a couple hundred pound a month guaranteed like you may or may not from a buy to let if you've got a good tenant in there would you say that's a disadvantage when you're getting started yeah the lure of those that big chunk of money is i think why a lot of people started but when i first started even though i wasn't actively it was never a strategy I went out to do as in source and I just had a spare deal here and there um, that I couldn't do and thought it was a good deal for another investor. It's exciting, but then if you can't complete on it or you can't source it, then you don't get anything for it. So it's a buy to let a couple of hundred consistently every month, isn't it? Whereas a sourcing fee, you only get paid when the deal completes or exchanges so it's a three or four months potentially down the line and it's not today 
and you can even get down the line and something happens at the very end uh, maybe evaluation goes wrong or the solicitors might find something uh, absolutely at the yeah. very end so it's i suppose the other caveat with that is is you might get everything agreed in principle which is great for everyone involved and then it might get to the very end stage something happens it's out of everyone's control and yeah you just you kind of yeah, got to basically yeah yeah and, that, and there's no income for that particular deal so all that time and effort and money spent progressing the deal yeah the disadvantage is there is no recourse it is that is part of the job unfortunately everyone's got a property horror story everyone's got one everyone's got one uh you don't have to give away names or anything like that please don't uh but if you've got a, a specific have you got a specific horror story that something that's happened to you um that you know you'd like to share with everyone just as a dose of reality of, of stuff that you know can happen in property in terms of sourcing oh oh you put me on the spot now yeah let's um, yeah we'll do it in terms of sourcing uh, and then if you've got a, a different example from a personal experience and add that in there as well okay so well my horror story would be what we've just discussed really is you source a deal you do all this work and then you're four five months down the line and your buyer pulls out so it's like oh do i have somebody in the background who would take that on and it may no longer be a good deal for whatever reason the market might have changed and things may have changed so that's happened to me a couple of times um lucky i've got the network i've got and i can generally um find another buyer that it suits because i know each of their criteria um or I'll, worst comes to worst and i'll make sure i complete on it myself um that, that'd be my sourcing sort of horror story because it's just part of the job unfortunately it's great when it works like anything but then the flip side of that is if you were banking on that money and the deal falls over you don't have another buyer who's willing to take it on then um, potentially it could be dead in the water so that's that's one um personally i think they're all lessons aren't they rather than horror stories but a big one for me would be just knowing your numbers and doing your numbers right builders having clear expectations and telling builders exactly what you want so you might budget for a twenty thousand pound refurb for example um and it turns out at 30 or 35 so builders in the uk have been my horror and my challenge because coming from australia i had certain preconceptions that people um have certain qualifications in the building trade over here and they don't <laughs> so you need to um yeah i think as an investor interview and see examples of projects and um get a quote rather than estimate so it was another another thing of mine we live and learn we do live and learn and i'm still and i'm haven't given up and i get up every day because at the end of the day i enjoy it and i can see portfolios growing and that's the main thing and helping tenants out when people talk to you about wanting to get involved in sourcing wanting to start sourcing and I'm talking from an agent point of view as such. Uh, what are the most common queries or concerns that you hear from people? From, from a potential sourcer, sorry? Yeah, if someone, if, if, so if I was looking to get involved into property sourcing and starting up, uh, and you obviously you speak to a lot of people anyway, what, what are the common concerns and queries that you hear from people that are looking to start? Uh, initially, what do they need to do to become regulated? So it's becoming more and more prevalent in, in property training around the country that they need to be regulated if you're going to be a deal sourcer, which is great. But there's a, also a middleman in there, I think, making a lot of money out of it when really when I get queries through our platform about because they have to be regulated to work on our platform and how they go about it, they that's a popular question and it's an eye opener for them when they realize it isn't actually that expensive. They could just do it themselves. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the main thing really. Is there any specific 
property sourcing training that you could recommend or a book that someone could read or is it relatively straightforward you can google it and, and get started tomorrow oh so i'm bringing out an online module over the next few months for sourcing it is yeah it, your network and building that is key and i think there are many successful sources who haven't had formal property training but if you wanted to a lot of people do like the training because it shortcuts their way into the industry potentially so the pin network um simon's that she runs one day three day courses depending on different strategies so that's a, and they have networking events all around the country so it, there's a good resource um to tap into and very educational is content that he delivers so I'm on one of the pin teams as well and have been for years and I always get a lot out of it and you meet lots of different investors as well. So there's both sides of the coin at those kind of events. As for other training that's out there, none that I really know of because I haven't been involved in um, much training over the recent years. If that helps. Uh, well, it's perfectly understandable. It's, it's um, such a... Thing I like the thing I like about property sourcing is you know when if we're comparing this to again service accommodation, buy to lets, HMOs, etc. You can do course after course after course after course. Whereas property sourcing, to me, it strikes it strikes me that there's going to be some great content out there, but you might not necessarily need you know a two or three day course to do it. You might be able to get away with it by you know reading a good book or going on a one day event. Uh, it, mm. If you have to set itself up, and then you just crack on and do it, so absolutely, that's, yeah, it's what I like about this. Yeah, and it is. It's it is quick to get started, and you can get out there. So if you've got some get up and go, you could start sourcing deals straight away. Start your registration regulation in process, and while it's going through, there's nothing to stop you viewing properties, making offers, all of that kind of stuff. Whereas if you're an investor saving for a pot, then that may take some time, and so. It's popular. It's a popular model for people who want to become involved in sourcing. They get some deals, they get a nice chunk of money, they build that pot, and then they can go out and invest themselves and build that credibility as they go. Perfect. In terms of top tips for people wanting to get into sourcing, now I know you've covered a lot of really great things so far regulation yeah if we if we had to summarize and put it as a top three what would your top three tips for, uh, be for someone wanting to get into property sourcing my top three tips for property sourcing would be um become good at your numbers if your numbers don't work you won't sell any deals build those relationships with various people through advertising so you get your vendor leads through agents because they're a good source of leads as well. Um, your investors through networking groups. Um, it's two, isn't it? And my third one, to stay in people's mind. So whether that be across socials or whatever, you need to be at the forefront of your game, really, and that you create quality deals. No, that's great. And then I suppose your magic start at the top of all that would be regulation make sure you're regulated and everything's above board as well so um, let's make it four top tips that's great yeah that's my number one i think i've harped on them quite a bit throughout this about regulation without that i don't think there is a business in sourcing for an individual so i think as the market changes and people become more educated in property then um it just sets you apart from those who might not be doing such you know ethical deals per se yeah, to totally, totally with you on that. Uh, Janice, let just wrap up with a couple of quick questions. Uh, first one is about this strategy in the future. Where do you see property sourcing in, in 10, 20 years' time? Do you think it's still going to be around? What do you feel? How do you, how do you think about it? Um, I think it's a growing industry um, and platforms like ours would be evidence of that because it grows all of the time. Um, daily with people putting deals on, people getting started. We're approachable. We can. Our aim is to help people out, both the investor and the sourcer. So there is definitely, I think, a market there for good quality sources to produce good quality deals. 
and match them up to investors. Um, and I think those that think it's pretty easy, well, no, they won't be around in 10 or 20 years' time because it isn't easy. It, is, it takes a lot of time, energy and skill to build all those various facets that I do think done right, you can turn it into a sustainable business for years to come. And just leading on from that, do you have any final words of wisdom, words of encouragement for people wanting to get involved in sourcing? Find people that do what you want to do. So if you want to be a sourcer, go and find a sourcing agent or a company that is doing what you, what your, what you value, I guess. So if you think that a company like ours, for example, Property Deal Store, could help you and you believe in our morals then you, and they're aligned with your own, then you might touch base with them and find out how they do it, what they do, and people should be and are generally happy to help others get on their feet, especially if they're new and want to set them on the right path. And equally, if you find people that don't align with your vision, then you've got to be able to walk away and just keep looking. So, and education is important. I am an ex-teacher. And so I've invested heavily in my own education to get the knowledge I need, especially in a foreign country. And I don't, I wouldn't change it for the world because it's shortcut my time. What I've done in five years, I couldn't, I had seven years in Australia and I only managed to do three properties, whereas I've transacted dozens over the last five years or so. So that would be my top tips, education and find somebody who's doing what you're doing, what you want to do. Awesome stuff. That's really been incredibly useful. And thank you again for your time. Janice, if people, you mentioned property deal store uh, a couple of times. So let's quickly wrap off, uh, wrap up with that. So if people want to find out more about yourself and your company, how can they do that? So I'm one of the directors in propertydealstore.co.uk and we do aim to connect buyers with sellers. And we have a open and honest platform I'm easily accessible to help people along the journey and I've got staff that can walk people through the various processes with it. Um, yeah, basically just reach out. We're happy to help and we want to grow it organically and we want quality sources on it. And then with that, you get quality investors as well. We can complete on deals. So if I can help, just let me know. Absolutely. And for the benefit of the podcast and the audiobook and so forth for the podcast the links will be in the show notes uh, for the benefit of the audiobook or if you're reading this just look below the uh, information will be down there janice again thank you very much for your time i think that's yeah really really insightful look into property sourcing how it works uh, and the benefits of it so just to say all the best with adventures and thank you very much Thank you very much, Rob. It's been a pleasure.